Rawl Show. Talk with a Southern accent. I'm John Rawl, and we're glad that you could join us back here for this beginning of the week edition of the show that's all about the South. And in the last few days, especially if you're like me and prone to like history, there's been a very, very important day on the calendar. And it was on May 8th, Friday. And that was the day that the world remembered the end of the war in Europe. It was the 55th anniversary of VE Day, Victory in Europe Day, as it was on that day. And Rouse, France, World War II ended with the signature of the German Field Marshal and then a more uh, maybe not so anticlimactic ceremony also happened in Berlin within 24 hours with the Russians able to be there for that particular event. But it was a big day, the 55th anniversary of the war coming to an end in Europe. And then a couple months later, the war in Japan came to an end. It was a crazy time in the world, world at that time. Luckily, we still have some of our great World War II veterans with us. And a new book is out called The Hidden Nazi. And Dean Reuter is going to be coming on right now to talk about his book. He is an attorney. He lives in northern Virginia. And it's a fascinating read about a fascinating time in our world history. Dean, welcome into the Y'all Show to talk about the hidden Nazi. It's great to be with you, John. Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you for coming on the Y'all Show. And before we get into your book, again, as I said, you're an attorney. In fact, let me give you a little bit of your curriculum vitae, if you don't mind, as you are a fellow with the National Security Institute at the George Mason University Antonin Scalia Law School. That's not a that, that, that's a big feat right there. Then you're also the general counsel of the Federalist Society for Law. So it sounds like you know a little bit about the law. I do. I'm a lawyer by training, sort of a historian as a hobby, uh, but a, a, a real passion for World War II. So. Well, that is fantastic. When did you get your passion for WW2? I, you know, it's funny, The Hidden Nazi, I wrote that book in the first person, so I give a bit of my own background, but uh, my heritage is German. Uh, my, my, I happen to have been born in Germany myself, but that's because my father was a U.S. Army officer and he was stationed there. So my family's been here for 150 years, but uh, I have this fascination with how uh, such a highly cultured, a highly established leading uh, society like the, the Germans in the 1930s uh, could go off the rails so quickly. And not just the war, but the Holocaust as well. Right. Where were you born in Germany? Heidelberg, on a military base. Oh, yeah. I've been to Heidelberg. Great little place yeah. there. And Baden-Württemberg is the state of Germany. It's amazing. Right around, let's see, right around Heidelberg, I know of at least one place called Bad Kreuznach, which is also a home of a U.S. Army post. And that particular installation, at least when I was there in the 90s visiting, it was a training ground for the Nazis during World War II. And when the war ended, our U.S. personnel went into these same barracks and set up shop. This was, I think, the headquarters of one of our cavalry divisions. And it was so amazing. You could get about two miles outside of town and look back at what was then the U.S. Army's headquarters and on the roofs of the of the installation had the German Nazi looking writing on top of the roof. It was really kind of creepy. It is. There are still to this day, even not just to the end of the 1990s, but to this day, there are uh, relics. There are marks of the war. There are marks of Nazi Germany, um, not just within Germany, but uh, throughout Europe and the, and the territory they, they, they conquered at the height of their uh uh, victories in World War II. So uh, you're right, it's 75 years uh, since the, the close of the war, uh, but um, the ripples uh, and certainly the effects of it are still felt today. And there's not a war movie that I try not to miss. It's, it's a fascinating time, and so many of our people just take it for granted. And as I said, Dean, we still thankfully have a handful of World War II veterans with us. And so if you know anybody, if you have a parent or grandparent that's a WW2 veteran that's still with us, please thank them, especially since in the last few days we've celebrated the end of World War II, the 75th anniversary of it coming to an end in Europe. Your book is called The Hidden Nazi, The Untold Story of America's Deal with the Devil. And this is specifically about SS General Hans Kammler. And he was known for his work at Auschwitz, but also what he did with the V-2 missile program. Please give us a little bit more information on General Kammler. 
Happy to do so, John. He is uh, born in 1901, an architect and an engineer by training, uh, but a Nazi to the core. Uh, we found that he joined the Nazi party before Hitler became chancellor. He joined the SS, the inner circle, the dreaded Schutzstaffel, uh, before Hitler became president of Germany. So he was an ideologue. He was a leader, not just a follower. Um, and his early projects uh, before the war and early on were pretty benign, but uh, they became more and more sophisticated. He became known for his um, ability to do things efficiently. He uh, was the Henry Ford of Germany, I would say, in terms of implementing standard, the use of standard material and standard processes um, and all the efficiencies that those led to in, in these building projects. He also became a master at finding very scarce resources within the Third Reich. Uh, so when Germany came at time to implement the Holocaust, when they made the decision to go forward, uh, with a uh, totalitarian, uh, tyrannical attempt to annihilate an entire race, the Jewish population, they turned to Hans Kammler. And we see that it was, we've got the paperwork, Hans Kammler signing an order in September uh, before the Wannsee Conference that I'm sure you're familiar with. Everybody thinks of the Wannsee Conference as the uh, decision to, to begin the Holocaust. But uh, four months before that, in September, the year before that, Hans Kammler signs the order identifying Auschwitz as, as the major killing camp and a major slave labor camp. Uh, he stands up an architectural office there headed by his people, and he makes weekly, sometimes daily visits to Auschwitz to make sure the camp is doubled and then redoubled and then redoubled again in size so that it ultimately houses a quarter of a million people, some as slaves, some bound for the gas chambers immediately. And after touring the Eastern countries to um, do research, uh, it's really chilling, research on the best and most efficient killing methods available, uh, he struck upon Zyklon uh, B, the gas, um, the uh, prussic acid uh, that was used in the gas chambers. And then he built the gas chambers and the ovens at Auschwitz and elsewhere, not just Auschwitz. His, his work was duplicated throughout the Third Reich, uh, these killing camps and the slave labor camps. From there, John, he went on to rule over uh, Germany's slave labor trade, uh, taking the healthiest of the Jewish population and renting them out to the German government, to German industry. Lots of uh, corporate names that your, your listeners would recognize today. Um, and uh, from there, he went on to rule all of Germany's secret weapons, including the rockets that you mentioned. And again, the book is The Hidden Nazi, a fascinating read, especially if you like nonfiction books. The subject of World War II is something many, many of us are captivated by, and the story, you just can read this stuff over and over. But what's amazing about Dean Reuter's book is it really focuses in on a character that was right there, the, the sort of central part of what we know what was so terrible about the Holocaust, and here's a guy that wasn't named Himmler, that wasn't named Goebbels, wasn't named Hitler even, and his name is Hans Kammler. And if you don't know about him, this new book helps explain why he was the hidden Nazi. Let's talk about right there at the end of the World War War II in May of 1945, Dean. This guy has a questionable ending to his life. What more can you tell us about the demise of Herr Kammler? Well, he does have a questionable ending. According to his driver, he was trapped in Prague, Czechoslovakia, managed to escape Prague to the south, uh, and then stopped at the roadside. Uh, his driver had him stop. Um, and then he walked off into the woods and shot and killed himself. Uh, and that's one of the reasons nobody ever pursued Hans Kammler. Um, but uh, you know, there were questions about his suicide story. Uh, the driver never returned his dog tags, the identity discs, what the Germans used as dog tags, or his sidearm or his paperwork that every soldier carried. That was a requirement of the era. You return those three items to the nearest Red Cross station or the nearest battle station as proof of death. It was never returned, and his body was never found. A post-war search for his grave turned up empty, um, and by this time, Kammler was an Obergruppenführer, which is the highest commissioned rank in the SS. He was 
elite. This is, and he was the equivalent in rank of George Patton. So losing Kamler's body is like losing George Patton uh, in the field of battle. It's just not going to happen. So there were questions from the start, and I don't know why people didn't pursue Kamler, but his death was very suspicious. Even so, a German court adjudicated him dead at the request of his wife. And so the Nazi hunters never pursued him and history never pursued him. Uh, and that's one of the things that raised the curiosity of, of myself and my co-authors, uh, this suspicious tale of his death. And we began to piece together the actual facts. Uh, and we prove in The Hidden Nazi that he had something he could deliver to the United States to try and erase his past and uh, save his own life. And I don't want to give your whole book away, but there's a good reason you're writing that part of your book. And that reason is what he did there with the V-2 missile program and how the U.S. was going to be ultimately in an arms race with the Soviet Union. And we saw a lot of SS members end up not only coming to the United States, but they specifically moved to Huntsville, Alabama, there with the Marshall Space Flight Center and helped launch the NASA propulsion industry. Yeah, a lot of your listeners, I'm sure, are familiar with the name Werner von Braun. He oh. was the lead, he was the lead rocket scientist. If you could only have one guy, he's the guy you'd want. But we ended up getting several hundred people um, in 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 a in what most people think was an accident of history that that the United States just had the good fortune to stumble upon this rocket team of several hundred people. But we pieced together in the Hidden Nazi what we call the Kamler deal. And there's six or seven steps, but I can I can rip through them pretty quickly. Sure. Um, the, the V-2 rocket you mentioned, a supersonic, all-powerful rocket uh, that was years ahead of anything any anybody had. It ultimately became our moonshot and our ICBM, and it was a key to us winning the Cold War. So it was vastly important for us to get a V-2 rocket. They started uh, being used in battle in uh, late 1944, October 1944, uh, actually launching these, these missiles. So a month later, November 1944, the Americans contract with General Electric to build a V-2-type rocket because it's now been revealed on the battlefield. December of 1944, just a month later, Kamler's emissaries are meeting with Americans in Lisbon, neutral territory, Portugal. Uh, with representatives of the American government and General Electric. Uh, and the, the war is still raging. This is the month where we have the Battle of the Bulge and Kamler's people are meeting with General Electric and the Americans. In January, Kamler signs an order to move the rocket team from its north, north coast location, where it's about to be overtaken by the Soviets, down to central Germany, uh, Konstein Mountain. Uh, that's January 45. The, the very next month, the Yalta conference happens. That's the conference at which the allies decide which ally is going to control which part of the German territory. And it turns out the place Kamler just moved the rocket team is going to be in the Soviet zone. So he's been thwarted in his attempt to preserve the rocket team. So he has to sign another order, moving the rocket team a second time in April of 1945 down to Bavaria, um, southern Germany, literally within a week's march of the U.S. Army. There were many places he could have taken this rocket team, but what he ended up doing was putting them on the front porch uh, of the American uh, Army and its advance. And, and that's what we call the Kamler deal, that sequence of events where he's turning this rocket team over to save his life, to erase his Holocaust past. It's an extraordinary thing, uh, but it really doesn't make sense if you accept the notion that Kamler committed suicide. Why would he make these intricate movements of so many masses of people and equipment if he's just gonna walk off in the woods and shoot and kill himself? Um, and the big reveal in, in, in The Hidden Nazi is that, of course, he didn't kill himself. He never committed suicide. Ah, that's where I was hoping you were going with that. Uh, and now, if there, you're not trying to say he's still alive because he would be about 120 years old right now, but that's correct. As he, I think, hey, was born 1901. Yeah, yeah, he, he's not hanging out with Adolf Hitler somewhere down in Argentina right now. Wrapping up our conversation with Dean Reuter, he's the author of the new book, The Hidden Nazi: The Untold Story of America's Deal with the Devil. And boy, it sounds like it could have been a deal. And it makes a lot of sense. I mean, Dean, your book really does make a whole lot of sense if, if this is what happened, because his crimes, unlike Werner von Braun, his crimes you couldn't run from with what he did there at Auschwitz and the other yeah. SS things there. But his knowledge was so valuable and so necessary because 
luckily our leaders of this country and even our allies other than Russia knew what the Soviet Union would end up becoming over the Cold War period. And so we had to get a leg up on those guys and having, even though they were enemies just weeks before, having people like this Nazi come in our fold and help our calls out going forward was so important. So we're excited about the new book, The Hidden Nazi. You got right there, let me show everybody, right there in the background, over Dean's right shoulder, you'll see the book cover, The Hidden Nazi. Dean, where can we find your book? It's on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble. All the online outlets have it. It's available, as you see here, in, in hardback. It's on CD discs. It's in Audible. It's in Kindle. So you don't even have to leave your house to, to order it. And I got to tell you that everything I just mentioned, we prove with U.S. government documents. And oh. they're all laid out. They're all laid out in the book. I knew you were going to prove it because you're a lawyer. Let me remind everybody, not only are you a lawyer, you're a fellow at the National Security Institute at George Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School and also the general counsel of the Federalist Society for Law. He knows the law and he knows history. And Dean Reuter has been on with us right now. Also, check out Dean on Twitter at Dean Reuter, F-E-D-S-O-C, and on Facebook, Dean Reuter Books. By the way, his last name is R-U-E-T-E-R, good German name, sehr gut, Dean Reuter, here on today's Y'all Show. Thank you for coming on, and it's been an absolute pleasure to chat with you here on the show that's all about the South, and a good Northern Virginian. Yeah, there you go. Can't get any further south than Richmond, right? Good to be with you. <laughs> Good to be with you very much. Thank you very much. We've got more of today's Y'all Show headed your way. Don't miss out. Don't forget an hour or two. Our Takapola storyteller, Jerry Short, is going to be on all this right here on the show that covers everything Southern. And again, thank you to all of you who served in World War II and to all of our great veterans. <laughs>